My name's Tom Jackson. I'm a senior developer at Boston Studios. I'm here today to talk to you about uh, global illumination and how we made a lighting solution for a game with a very big streaming world. I'll go over the challenges, the problems with the current solutions that are out there at the moment, and then I'll show you a little bit of the solution and some Unity hacking at the end. OK, so we're all on the same page. Uh, what is global illumination? Now, you probably all know what it is, but the basic idea is that it's a simulation of indirect light. And that means light that is bounced off of other surfaces onto surfaces. So here's a, an image that just shows direct light. So you can see it looks very unnatural. This is what you wouldn't expect in a game. So the old school approach was to use a fixed ambient, which is Basically, it's like a color or a gradient or something that an artist has chosen that is applied over the whole scene. So the shadows like on the, the tree here, they look quite nice, quite natural. But the shadows over the whole scene are the same color because this ambient term has just been applied globally. So areas like under, the, under that sort of underground structure look kind of like a little bit wrong, a little bit off. So when you have global illumination, you still maintain these sort of nice outside shadows. But then when there is an area that is more in shadow, it does appear darker because there's like less bounce light. So I kind of like to think of it as sort of smart light. It's like light that knows, has some sort of sense of what is going on in its environment. So that's kind of what, what global illumination is. So what is Worlds Adrift? Now, this is the latest game we've been working on at Bossa. It's uh, physics-based open-world MMO, which is quite a, a, it's quite a challenging concept in, it, in itself. But it's all persistent, and it takes place in this, uh, in this world that's full of floating islands. So you fly your airships around, you go exploring these islands, and it's, it's all running on this technology called uh, Spatial OS by a company called Improbable. And on the, the clients, all the clients use a Unity, obviously. So because of the type of game Worlds Adrift is, it does bring up a few issues when it comes to lighting. So the first is the size, as I just mentioned. We have close to 1,000 islands in the world at the moment, and each one of these is anything up to a kilometer uh, cubed in volume. And as the game gets more popular, we aim to make the, the world even bigger. So we're kind of going to scale up the world as the player numbers increase, because we want to keep the player density the same. So it's kind of an unlimited sized world. It has a dynamic time of day, so the lighting conditions are always changing, which means that the, the, any sort of lighting solution we come up with has to be able to cope with that. It has a lot of UGC. Now, this is quite cool. We have a, a tool called the Island Creator, which the community have been using to make pretty much all of the islands that you see in the game. And it's great, because they're doing amazing environmental storytelling, but they use the assets that we've provided them in very unorthodox ways. They might take a huge statue and use it as a, a chess piece. And so we have all these sort of, these very sort of interesting scale problems. And the last one is that it's a non-static world. So because of the size of the world, again, we have to do a lot of sort of, a lot of tricks to make sure that the game doesn't suffer from floating point precision problems. And because of that, we have to stream everything in, which means that we can't rely on any of Unity's static flags that it allows uh, for, for its inbuilt lighting. So with all these problems, you'd probably think, well, do we really need it? Is there some sort of way we can just get away with using a fixed ambient? Or can we just do some tricks? But it was always from the inception of the game, we had, this really, uh, we had these great concept art pictures of, of these huge sprawling meadows, but also on the same island, there'd be complicated cave structures, or there would be some kind of um, some interiors of, of small buildings or cathedrals. So all of these things would take place on the same island. So we needed some way to have all of these different lighting conditions be able to be available on a single island. So yeah, we kind of really did need it. And then the designers were very, very, very sort of adamant that we had to have dark caves. That was the most important thing because for gameplay reasons, you want to hide treasure and you want to hide horrible enemies in caves and you don't want people to be able to see them. If you have that fixed ambient across the whole scene, then the caves are just as light as the outside areas. So we needed to have some way to make dark caves. That was the goal. 
So what are the current approaches to GO? The first we're all familiar with is the baked GO, which is basically your sort of standard light mapping. You model the lighting in the scene with as many bounces as you like, and then for everything that's set to static, you bake it into textures. And that's great. If you don't have any moving lights and nothing in the world moves, then this is a really nice, cheap, and looks really good way of getting GI. But the problem is, obviously, in our game, everything does move because of the non-static uh, non world. And we have a time of day, which is where the, the pre-computed GI or the dynamic GI comes into play in Unity. So this is a, a more sort of modern global illumination. It uses some clever enlightened tricks and real-time light maps that let you have moving lights. So you can have a light source that can move, and the bounce light will be simulated. But it still requires things to be static in the world. You still have, have this pre-compute uh, bake time where everything needs to be static. And when we were doing this, we were getting, because we did try to get this, this method to work, because we thought it would look good. But it was still between two and four hours bake times per island. And so when you've got 1,000 islands, that's like 4,000 hours of baking. And then the data sizes were really big. They were like 70 or 80 megabytes per island. So times that by 1,000 again. And then the, the client size has just gone up by quite a lot. Now, it's worth pointing out that there is also some real-time techniques that have been um, researched at the moment. Special mention to this uh, Asset Store plugin, which has got the closest, I think, to having any kind of full real-time with no baking whatsoever. But they all re use really large 3D textures because they voxelize the scene. And that means that your bandwidth use on your, on your GPU is insane. I think you can probably use about half a gigabyte of VRAM just on your lighting if you use a full real-time approach. And we already had this really big performance burn in Worlds Adrift, because we have this huge sky, and we use the clouds as a lot of gameplay for, for a lot of gameplay. So we couldn't cheap out on the clouds. So we have a really sort of nice volumetric cloud solution. So that's kind of our big performance burn. So we couldn't afford to spend any more uh, GPU bandwidth on the lighting if we could help it. Now, this is an interesting technique that I think I saw in this game, but it's something I thought about called stochastic ray casting. So the idea being that you still have a fixed ambient for the whole game, but at all times you're just sending out random ray casts from the camera into random directions. And then based on how many of those hit something, you could be determining how outside you are, if you like. So your outsideness factor. And then your outsideness factor is just multiplied by the ambient. So you can see when this guy backs into the cave, the whole scene seems to go darker because the camera now thinks he's inside. But the problem with that is, I think you probably guessed, is when you're standing outside the cave, then you can now see into the cave because the global ambient has been shifted up. And then everything that's inside the cave becomes visible. So that wasn't good enough for our designers. Before I go into our solution, there's just a couple of points I need to go about how we built our world so that you'll understand the solution a bit better. So the first is when I was talking about the floating origin. So we have this. So the blue dot here is the player moving around the world. And at any time, any one moment in the game, there can be 10 or 20 islands that he can see in the, in the sky. But we can't have every single object loaded for all of those islands, because that would be ridiculous, a big waste of memory. So we have the concept of the active island, which is the island that's closest to the player. And then what we do is we shift the coordinates of the whole world around that active island. So the active island is always at 0, 0, 0 in the player's scene. So in the local client, that's always at 0, and everything else shifts around. We don't have any of the objects on the islands when they are instantiated. We instantiate all the objects, so all the little props and trees and pieces of, uh, pieces of rock are all loaded through these lists. So we have two of these lists. We have one for the large objects on the island and one for the small objects on the island. So the large objects are, are now streamed in for every island that you can see, because they will probably affect the silhouette. And then the small objects are only loaded for the closest island, because they probably, you probably can't see them when they're two kilometers away on another island. So they're just simple JSON lists. We have just the, the ID of the prefab and a position, rotation, and scale. And that's it. That's all you need. And then we, we do load balance them over a certain amount of frames and stuff. But that's how we sort of, that's how we build the world. So the client scene, when you're looking at it in Unity, is completely empty to begin with until the player's dropped in and then all these islands start streaming in. So the requirements 
We just need lightning fast pre-compute time, because we don't have time to bake thousands of islands worth of data if they're going to take four hours. No reliance on static flags in Unity. Small data size, because it's all going to be included in the client. It needs to blend with our dynamic time of day somehow, and it needs to have a negligible performance hit. And the solution that we've come up with is what I call vertex texture fetch visibility maps interpolated from light probes. So it's, a, it's a bit of a mouthful, so we could probably work on the title. But here's how it works. There's a five-step process that you have to do for each island. First, you need to place probes. So you need a light probe group that is out, like, good for that island. So you, you put an island in the scene, you spawn all the objects on it, and then you have to make a light probe group. You then bake that probe data. And then you have to store the data for each vertex for every object on the island. So for every single rock, every LOD level of that rock, we need to store the a, a data for each vertex. And then we need to load that at runtime and then use it on the GPU. So sounds easy, but we'll go for it. So probe placement. Now, everybody knows placing light probes is really fun. So doing it for 1,000 islands is really, really fun. And then when the islands are going to keep coming in, so you're get, getting more every week, needing to add to the game, it kind of becomes too much fun. So we need to have an automatic way of doing it. So how do you automatically place pro light probes on an island? So the way I did it was, for every single object, we create like a, a web of points around that object. So we use the bounding box of that object and the size. And we just create like a load of random points around there. They're all based on the size, so they kind of follow the shape of the object. And then this is all sort of like, you can multiply this so you can choose how many there will be. But the idea is to get like the density of the points right. The, the amount isn't so important. It's just you want more points around objects than you do when there isn't any objects. Because if there is objects, the lighting conditions are probably going to be changing a lot. So you need more probes. So out in an open field, there probably won't be very many. There'll just be one or two that have been placed by the terrain. But then when there's a, a big cluster of objects, you'll get this sort of web of, of light probes. Now, when you do that, there are obviously going to be some that will end up inside an object. It's inevitable. So you need to get rid of those, because they're unnecessary, and they can mess up your data. So you do an inside object check, which is it's called the odd-even rule. It's pretty simple. Just for every probe position, we cast a ray from an arbitrary position in space. And then we cast it through every collider in the scene. And we see how many times that ray hit. You go both ways, and then you add them up. If it's odd, then it's inside an object. If it's even, then it's outside. So as soon as we get an odd number, we just remove that position from the list. And then finally, we do a merge like pass, where for every probe position that's left, we get one that's nearby within a certain distance. And then we raycast between them. If it doesn't hit anything, then we sort of squeeze them together, and they become one in the middle. And that can take your probes down by quite a lot. So that's how you get rid of the sort of oversaturation from the first, from the first step. OK, and that would give you a pretty good valid light probe group for pretty much every island that we chucked at it. And that's good. But now you need to bake the probes so that they have some useful information in them. And we need the indirect data so we can just use Unity because that allows you to bake light probes. But the problem we found is, because we were doing this around 5.4, I think we were, it was around Unity 5.4, uh, when you're using Enlighten, it would still take two to four hours per island, even though you just wanted the light probes, because it does that bit at the end. So it would do all of its normal light baking and light transport propagation and all this crazy stuff. And then just like a little bit at the end would be the light probes. And that was pretty annoying. And I'd heard about this progressive light mapper tech that had been sort of like talked about on the forums. So I, I begged some people uh, in high places to, to let me have a look at it. And we tried it out on an island with 10,000 probes. And it took about a minute. And we were like, wow, OK, this, this is now feasible. We can bake 10,000 probes in under a minute, whereas before it would take two to four hours. This might actually work. This is pretty cool. So that's what we did. So now you've got this light probe group for an island. Looks good. You've baked it with the progressive light mapper. The light probes are all working. It might just make sense now just to use light probes for everything. Everything's being streamed in. Why don't we just use light probes? But there's, there's obviously one problem with light probes is that if you have a big object and you use light probes, then 
it will look wrong if, it, if it's a large object that crosses wide areas of different lighting conditions. Now, Unity does have a solution for this called the Light Probe Proxy Volumes, which effectively makes like a 3D texture for each object that you set it to that stores the lighting information in it across, those, across that texture. But it was really bad if you had every single object using one of these 3D textures, your bandwidth just goes crazy. And yeah, we found it was too slow. So we needed something else. But that, you know, it's fair to, fair to say that could have worked. And we do still use the light probes for our dynamic objects and our really small objects. But for the larger objects, we, need to do, we do need to bake some information into the vertices. So here's what we do. We get an interpolated probe value for every single vertex of every object. So like I said earlier, if you've got every single renderer for every LOD, you just use this light probes dot get interpolated probe for the world position of that vertex. Sample it based on the world normal of that vertex. And that will give you a color value that's pretty accurate, as long as your light probe grid is set up well for the indirect sort of contribution for that vertex. And that's cool. You can do that for all, all the vertices in the scene. And then we have to write them to a texture. While we're cycling through all these vertices, doing that get interpolated probe, we're writing them to a texture. And that's kind of like a light map, sure. But it's a little different. You can't really obtain any information just from looking at it. But the GPU will know what to do with these colors later. But the good thing is you can fit 2 million vertices on two 1024 textures. So that's what we did. And that was kind of our limit anyway. I don't think we had any islands that had more than that. But you know, if you needed more, three 1K textures would give you 3 million. And you know, that's, that's, that's more than enough that we would need. So this is what one of those textures looks like at the end. It's just kind of like noise. Which is why I sort of refer to them as visibility maps rather than like texture maps or light maps, because you can't really tell anything from them just by looking. But all the while we were doing that, so for every object, we grab an object from the scene and we start working through all of its vertices, writing these colors down into a texture. How is it going to know which part of this texture to look at later? Well, we store just the start position, so the UV coordinate of that texture in these little lists that we had. And then we can use that when we instantiate the objects later. We can tell it what to do with them. So once we've got the, all of these visibility maps and this light probe group all baked and ready, we just put them all into one asset bundle. So there could be a couple of textures and one light probe group, stick it in an asset bundle, and then associate that with the island. And then when that island is loaded in, when it becomes active, we load the asset bundle, and then the light probe group appears, and then we can set the textures using this. So the light map settings class in Unity allows you to sort of overwrite the light maps that might be baked in the scene. It doesn't just let you overwrite them, it lets you set them. Like I said, we didn't do any baking in the scene, in the client scene, just while we were, while we were messing around with these, uh, these islands, we, we saved out these textures to an asset bundle. So if you open the lighting window, you, you can see that if, there's, if there is any light maps baked, you can see these maps there. And if you then overwrite them using, this, uh, using the light map data and setting those, then you'll, you'll see them change in that window. Even though they're not like Unity hasn't baked them or anything, you can set them up. And then when we load in these objects, we go through the renderers and we set the light map index and the light map scale offset to the values that we put in those lists. Now, what that does is it lets us use these values in a shader, which are the Unity Lightmap ST and the Unity Lightmap. So Unity Lightmap ST is a float for in shaders, and that is just a one-to-one -one, uh, equivalent to the Lightmap scale offset that you set in C Sharp. And the Unity Lightmap is a sampler, which is a texture based on the index of the texture in that lighting window. So the cool thing is, is that even if you don't use baked lighting or you don't have any objects set to static, all of this stuff still works. Unity still sends the light map and the light map scale offset to the shaders, to these renderers, even if they're not static, and even if there's no pre-computed pre or baked GI enabled in the lighting window. And I don't know if it is a bug, but if it is, please don't fix it, because this whole system would just not work without that being the case. It does seem like it's an overhead that maybe is always going on, but I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's not much. But 
Anyway, that's good. And I think you could do other things with this. You could, you could use that information to make loads of little crazy hacks. So then when you're on the GPU, you need to somehow use that information. So you've got this, you've got this position of the first vertex on this texture, and you've got this texture. So what do you do with it? So this here uses the SV vertex ID semantic, which is something that was introduced in DirectX 10. And it's basically an integer that is the, the vertex index. And it's the same ordering as the vert order on the CPU. Obviously, it's, set, it's sent. So you can then you can actually extrapolate the, the full UV coordinate of that vertex just based on the vertex ID and the start position of the, of, of the, uh, of the object. And it's simple. It's just a, f a frack and a floor. It's very, very light operations on the GPU, so it really doesn't cost much at all. And then you do a vertex texture fetch on that texture with that UV, and there you'll have your ambient value for the vertex. And the, the GPU now knows, OK, that is what my indirect contribution is. So that's pretty cool. But then you need to set it in the fragment shader. Now, if this looks familiar to anyone, then it's probably because the the bottom line of this function here, the out emission, if you've ever done like show generated code on a surface shader, that's effectively the last line of a surface shader, which is where Unity does some sort of internal lighting function call. So what, I, what we do on, in our case is we, we actually use the generated code instead of the surface shaders for most of our shaders that need to use this. And then we just write one line above it where we, we set the indirect diffuse value to this value that we've got from the shader. And then Unity does the rest. Unity handles that as if it is an indirect thing, and it uses it in its lighting functions. So we kind of don't have to do anything else. We just tell it, yeah, this is now your ambient value. This is your indirect. Like, ignore everything you heard before. And then as long as that's just before the last lighting function, it will work. The other thing to notice here is there's this times by ambient intensity on the, on the right of the first line. And that's actually to do with the time of day. So this is where the time of day comes into it. So what we do is we have a value that's set by an artist. It's just a curve, which is like ambient intensity over time. And what this does is it, it effectively just multiplies the, the, the indirect by a fixed number based on the time of day. So in the middle of the day, you have a large number, and at night, you have a small number. It sounds really simple, but if you think about how it would work in a cave, the ambient value is already so low, so any kind of change in this multiplication is not really going to affect that value very much. But outside, where the ambient value is high, it will change quite a bit. And you can see here, this video, these two videos playing at the bottom are two locations on the same island. So you can see on the right, the cave always remains quite dark with its shadows. But on the left, outside, the daytime has really quite bright and light shadows in the middle of the day. And then at nighttime, it has darker shadows. So we kind of had exactly the effect we needed. So here's a video showing what our game looked like before we put this GI mode on, and then what it looked like after. So it's quite a big contrast in, in how it looks. It certainly overall becomes darker, but when you see like the interior of a cathedral like this, it just looks completely wrong when you put the, the GI on. You just think, how did we ever think that was OK? Because we did. That was how our game looked. Like When the GI was off, that's how our game looked until probably four or five months ago. Even inside houses like this, you can see just having that slightly little darker area inside the house really sells the scene a lot more. So we've managed to come up with this kind of like esoteric way of using light probes to do all of the sort of the baking, if you like, beforehand. We still use the light probes because they're still loaded in, so they're used for all the dynamic objects like the player and any of the ships and the physical parts. But then for everything that's sort of, I can't really say static because it's not, the, because Unity is, it's not Unity static, it's like non-moving. So for all the non-moving objects in our world, we use this approach of baking them into these visibility maps and then using those custom shaders. And the great thing is, is because it's a vertex texture fetch, it doesn't need any extra UV channels. So the artists are free to use the UV channels for whatever weird shader uh, needs they want. So they can have all sorts of tiling or emissions and things like that. And it, it's fine. We, we don't need to worry about taking up a UV channel. OK. So that's kind of 
that's where we are now with the game. That looks pretty good. It's all working. But there was one other thing that we sort of thought we wondered if it would be possible. And that was like, could it all be done 100% at runtime? So no editor functionality whatsoever. So although you know, you've got your light mapping in Unity to bake the probes, and you can create light probe groups in Unity, could you, is there any way we could do this stuff at runtime? And the first question you'd ask is why, because that's a really difficult task, probably. And that's a very good question. And the answer is because of this. This is our island creator tool on Steam. So, like I said, like 99% of the islands in our game have been made by our community. And they're all made using this tool that we've got out at the moment. This is great. It's a free thing. It lets people be creative. And they're making amazing environments for us to use in our game. They're making, making genuinely like, meaningful content. But if they're making interiors or caves, they have no way of previewing what the lighting's going to look like, because they don't have the Unity progressive light mapper. And they don't have a way to do all, that, all of that stuff, because they don't have the editor. Like we do do it when we take their islands and convert them for use in the game. We, obviously, we go through that process. But they're making them, and they have no idea. So it wasn't like we wanted to have the exact sort of lighting system. We didn't want to like, completely copy it. It was like, is there just a way we could get like, a good enough, like a close enough comparison to how we have it in the game, just so these guys have some idea of what the inside of their buildings are going to look like, what the inside of their caves are going to look like? We thought maybe, yeah, there might, be, there might be a way. It's worth investigating. So first, we'll look at what is possible, what we know we can do in, the, in runtime. So we can create probe positions. That's just data structures and standard physics. All we're doing there is physics ray casting off the uh, objects to get that light probe uh, list. We can store data for each vertex, because that get interpolated probe call is available at runtime. And if you're writing to textures, you might as well just be writing to memory. It's the same thing if you're at runtime. You just write to textures in memory. And then we can use those data in the shade. We don't need to change the shaders. That's fine. That's fixed. So the things that are left are create a light probe group, bake the probe data, and load all the data at runtime. So baking the probes is basically creating a light mapping solution. So we'll leave that for a minute. Creating the light probe group is awkward. but. Loading all data at runtime is basically trying to get the light probe group. If you knew the data for the light probes, so that's fine. We can get that. How do we load it in at runtime? Before, we were using asset bundles, but it's impossible to make asset bundles at runtime. That's another editor class. So what do we do? So we need to investigate a little bit. So create a light probe as an asset. Create a light probe group as an asset. That's easy to do. You just use the asset database. You can create an asset, and that will just appear in your, in your project view. If, as long as there's light probes in the scene and they're baked, then that will just create a, an asset based on those. You set your asset serialization to force text. And then that means you can have a look at this light probe group in a text editor. It's a mess. It's just a mess of numbers, matrices, in, integers, a load of position data, and then a load of coefficients at the end. So I didn't really know what any of this data did, but that didn't matter. If we're going to try and load it in, it doesn't matter. As long as we know what the data is, we'll just try and load it. But there's no way. There's no way to get that data into Unity that I could see. There's no light probe group API. You can't create a new light probe group and give it this information, these matrices and these tetrahedral stuff. You have to go through an asset bundle. So we have to make an asset bundle in, in runtime. That's the only way that I could see. So it's a tricky problem, sure, but it's doable. It's just bytes, right? We just need to recreate the asset bundle at runtime. So the first thing I did was create two light probe groups, one with just one extra probe. So they're pretty much the same, except for one slight difference. And then save those both out to two asset bundles. And then you can use like a hex editor. And you can diff the two asset bundles that we've created. And this lets me see the differences, which basically means what, what, what do I need to worry about changing? And I found a few things out about the asset bundle format. So the first thing is that the header does change. There are little bits in the header that change, like the size of the asset bundle, um, how many assets are in that bundle, whatever. And then there's the light probe data at the end that always changes depending on you know, what the light probe data is. It's just a collection of numbers and coefficients and things like that. It's all just packed in at the end. But then there's this bit in the middle that I don't actually know what it is. But it always stays the same, so it doesn't really matter, right? 
we can just use a binary writer to write all the data from the light probe in just in sequential byte order. That's easy. The headers in Big Endian, which is really awkward because it means you have to flip all the bytes of integers and floats. So that's that's kind of awkward. But for the middle bit, I just saved out the middle part of the of the asset bundle as a file. And so now I just I can write the header with a, a big Indian writer, strap on that file, and then write my light probe data at the end. And then I've got this byte array that is effectively an asset bundle. I mean, it's not. I haven't made it in Unity. I've kind of cheated, because I've just been writing data from like little bits of reverse engineering and finding out what these bits are. But the good news is, is that it worked. And so this was like. This was the most, this was probably like the, the, the happiest I've ever been in a long time was seeing this in Unity. Because it was like a couple of weeks of just working through this asset bundle format and then seeing this. And I was like, right, it can be done. That's brilliant. Let's get onto the stuff like making a light mapper in C sharp. It was like, yeah. But so that was good. That meant it was possible because I thought that was going to trip us up properly. So then you've got to do runtime light probes. So the light probes themselves are not just a list of positions. It's not just a vector three list. It's actually a lot more stuff going on in there. There's all the, it's like all of these tetrahedra, and then there's Delaunay triangulation. There's matrices for all the different uh, sides, and there's whole rays and edge outer cells and stuff. And while I was, because I was looking at this, uh, this text of all the, the light probe group data, it was just, uh, I could work out bits of it. But it was really, really like black box stuff. There's these matrices that you just they just don't make any sense. They're just random numbers. And I was really trying to work out what they are by comparing different groups and things like that. And then I went online and did some research and found this, which is the guy Robert Coopers from Unity, who made the Light Probe group, who made the Light Probe implementation in Unity, had written like a full GDC talk and he'd done this talk. Explaining everything, the whole what that entire structure was, what all of those matrices were, even included source code for how to calculate these matrices. So I was like, okay, cool, <laughs> that's done. And and it was actually as easy as just copying like this block of source code out here, and converting it to C sharp, and then it, it would work. If I if I had these Delaunay tetrahedralized holes, I could I could use this. It would be fine. And so Delaunay triangulation or Delaunay tetrahedralization is a solved problem. It's out there. So when you have a solved problem, you know what you do. You go to the asset store. And you're like, right. And then I found this, geometry algorithms by Black Imp Software. And it was great. And it had a method inside it which created a Delaunay tetrahedralized convex hull based on a list of vector threes, which was exactly what I had. And I was like, cool. So with this, combined with the working out the, what the matrices were using Robert's talk, I had everything I need to actually create a light probe group, like the structure of the light probe group. And I knew how to put that into this asset bundle. So we're kind of nearly there. The only thing left is baking the probes, which is, is creating a way to bake these probes. So I don't know if this is the best way to do this. I won't lie. It might not be. But this is how I did it. So for each one of these probe positions that we've got, because we've done that, that bit, was, that bit was easy, I thought it would be cool if we could get like an isotropic distribution of points on a sphere and use those as like raycast targets from each probe point. That, that might be a, a, a good starting point. But this is, a, this is really not a trivial problem, this isotropic distribution thing. If you search for it on Google, you find there's, like, there's loads of different ways of doing it, and no one can agree with the best way of doing it. But this is the way that I did it, which is using this golden ratio um, algorithm. It's pretty easy to find on Google. You just search for that isotropic distribution. You can find this. And what it does is you can just give it a certain number of points, and then it will evenly distribute those over a sphere. So now I've got that. I assign a color to each one of those points using uh, the, the, the colors that the artist has set up in the lighting window. So for the sky, the equator in the ground color. We can use that, and they're sort of just, they're based on that. So they create like a nice gradient. And now for every probe in the scene, for every probe position, what we're doing is we are ray casting from each of these points out from, this, from each probe. And if 
any of those hit something, you, you ignore it. But if any of them don't hit something, so if they reach the sky, that's effectively like that probe saying, OK, yeah, I would have got some light from that sky now. So you can use this spherical harmonics class. That's built into Unity as well, and that's available at runtime. And so I was just adding tiny bits of directional light to these probes based on the color that was set in the, in the last step. And with all of those bits coming in, it does create a fairly good uh, spherical harmonic for the probe. It's not exactly as good as it would be if you did it in Unity, because it can do like 2 million mega rays or whatever, and it's all some crazy power VR path tracer. But this was like a close enough. Remember, that's what we were trying to get. We weren't going, oh, it's got to be perfect. It was like good enough just for these artists. They can press a button while they're making their islands, and then it will bake it out, and it will look cool. And so that kind of works. And then you can do a bit of bouncing as well. So if you just do like a vector 3 reflect, if that ray hits something, you can then like see if that next one will hit something. If it doesn't, you can. You can modulate the light intensity so it's like less because it was bounced. And it's like it's not accurate. It's like tricky, but it's it's good tricks. It sort of it gave us a close enough approximation. So let's put it all together. We got the light probe positions the same way we did at edit time. That was easy enough. We created the light probe mesh using that tool from Black Imp software called geometry algorithms. It was just one line to create this this data structure with all the tetrahedras in. And then we calculated the coefficients. So we used that weird sort of light mapper type thing that I made just to, to get a good enough coefficient for each probe. Then we put it all into our fake asset bundle. So we just stick all that data at the end of this, this weird byte array that Unity will, well, we're sort of tricking Unity into thinking it's an asset bundle. And then we load it back in the way we normally do. And then we celebrate. Because there we go, it's done. It's all there. It's in the scene. So we're going to show you the results of that. So, but before I do, I need to point out some things about the video that I'm about to show. It's, so this, is, this video is made by one of our community members. And he's like an amazing island creator. And he's been making amazing content for our game. And this video was all made just using the tool that we gave him. So it's all on Steam. So it's got like a spectator camera mode in. So he's cutting it all together to some music from our soundtrack. And yeah, everything in the, everything in the video was baked using this weird sort of hybrid, crazy runtime sort of light baking solution. So enjoy.
Okay, so yeah, the count will be down in real time. Cool. So yeah, it can all be done at runtime. It was that was all just baked inside that tool, and there were some errors here and there. I was noticing the odd rock didn't look right or whatever, but you know, overall it's pretty good. So yeah, I guess the moral of the story is, you know, if you if you do sort of think about things in a really hacky way, you can get Unity to do things that it really wasn't designed to do. Nobody really probably expected you to load an asset bundle just from a byte array that you've hacked together using hex editors and diff tools. But, you know, it worked. So, yeah, that's me. So thanks for your time.